This week on Political Capital, the president announces his plans to win the future for America. Will he get any Republicans to sign on? We asked senior presidential advisor David Axelrod about finding common ground. And on the last word, will they, won't they? Who will prevail in the debt ceiling debate? We begin the show with the president's senior advisor, David Axelrod, who joins me in our Bloomberg studio. Thank you for being here, Great David. Great to be here. The president said he was reaching out in the State of the Union. In response, <coughs> Paul Ryan said the lousy economy is Barack Obama's fault. we got to slash spending, cut taxes. Mitch McConnell said we'll compromise if he comes to our positions. They kind of gave you the back of the hand, didn't they? Well, you know, I think the question is really where the American people are. I think the American people are looking for us to cooperate. Uh, Al, you've been around this town a long time, and you know that there's a process uh, to this. There's a pacing to it. Uh, we're going to submit a budget in a few weeks. They're going to have to turn some cards over and be a little more specific about what they're thinking, and we're going to engage uh, in a discussion. I understand that there's tremendous momentum uh, for uh, among the American people for compromise, for progress. I think that's going to push everyone in the right direction. One of the first tests will be the debt ceiling. And Republicans say you're going to have to agree to specific budget cuts before they'll pass any extension. Is that reasonable? Well, first of all, we are submitting a budget that is going to be a very significant uh, uh, budget in terms of the cuts that we're willing to make. Uh, you know, some of them are going to be painful for us. Uh, and our seriousness will be clear. Again, they'll have to introduce some specifics. You know, on the debt ceiling, we have, look, we have to deal uh, with our deficit challenge. We have to deal with the long-term uh, debt issue. But let's be clear, if we, if we made every cut, and they haven't been specific, but the size of cuts that the Republicans are talking about, you'd forestall the need to lift the debt ceiling by 15 days. So. It's not really a serious. That's the, that, let's be serious about this. And I think so at the end of the day, I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, I expect people to act responsibly and understand that we're not going to play politics with the full faith and credit of the United States. So of the debt ceiling should not be linked to spending cuts. I think that we should be serious about spending cuts, and we are going to be serious about spending cuts. But I don't think we should play politics. Uh, with the with the, the uh, two, debt ceiling, the two separate. Okay. He also mentioned Simpson Bowles as a good starting point for long-term deficit uh, reduction. But he said there were things he didn't like. What what doesn't he like about Simpson Bowles? Well, again, you know, we've been very circumspect uh, because we don't want to we we don't want to delimit our uh, discussions. And uh, when you begin to pick things out, uh, then you are uh, then you are doing that. Obviously, um, uh, you know the. Social Security was one area of concern, but he believes that the uh, the commission did a good faith effort, uh, made a good faith effort. They certainly uh, drew bright lines around the problem and ought to give us an impetus to begin discussion. The president in 2009, I believe, gave an eloquent address in Cairo on the on the importance and the value of democracy. There are now demonstrations throughout Egypt, and the government is setting curfews, tear gas calling out the army today, cracking down, ignoring U.S. pleas to try to be more flexible and open. Is the U.S. once again supporting, in the position of supporting authoritarian government over the wishes of the people? Uh, let's be clear, the president, uh, now, you know, Egypt has, has been helpful uh, on some regional issues there, and we recognize that. But the president is very clear with President Mubarak uh, for the two years that he's been president uh, about the need to have uh, democratic reforms uh, in Egypt and to recognize the universal rights of the Egyptian people. And, uh, uh, and we certainly feel that way uh, today. The answer is not tanks in the street. The answer is reform. Can we look for a more forceful U.S. response then to calling for less tanks in the street? President is, uh, well, we've made, we've made our views clear and we're going to continue to do so. The president is monitoring this on a minute-to-minute on a -minute basis, as is the team at the uh, White House. I think Secretary Clinton has spoken to this uh, today. Uh, so we, we, we are going to push very hard. Uh, to uh, do what we can to make sure that uh, uh, the rights of the Egyptian people uh, are recognized and are taken into account. Here. David, has the president spoken to President Mubarak today? Uh, he has not. I don't believe he has. Isn't there a case for calling President Mubarak? Well, I think that there have been, there's been outreach between our government and, uh, and President Mubarak, but he's spoken to him recently, and even in those conversations recently, he repeated the need 
for democratic reforms uh, in that country. And do you think that this pro-democracy uprising is going to spread to other countries in the Middle East? Well, uh, you know, I, I think it's, especially in the world in which we live and given the modern uh, technology that we have, um, uh, you know, the, the, the yearning for, for, uh, for, for democratic rights, the, yearning, the expressions you see there are, are ones that we've seen in Tunisia and elsewhere. And, and uh, I don't think you put the genie back in the bottle. Let me turn to one or two more issues, um, other issues. The president vowed in the State of the Union to veto any bill that had earmarks in it. I think the last year he was in the Senate, he got $98 million of earmarks for the state of Illinois. It wasn't a big campaign issue uh, for him. And Senate Majority Leader Reid said the president is just playing power politics with that, uh, with that pledge. Well, I don't think that that is the case. The president, at a time when we're talking about uh, very severe uh, cuts and when we're talking about the need to discipline uh, spending, the symbolism of these earmarks is uh, something that can't be ignored. It's not a huge part of the budget, but it is an expression of concern about how we uh, spend money and the process by which we spend money. So uh, the president, and you know, he's been talking about this for uh, two years. He's been asking for reforms for two years. He fought for earmark reforms when he was in the Senate. He posted his uh, earmarks so that pe uh, requests so people could see them. Uh, so uh, this is not a new issue for them, but I, I would, you know, suggest that if you listen to uh, what has been said on the Republican side in the House and among Republicans in the Senate, uh, you know, their commitment is not to send a bill to the president right. uh, with earmarks. Has Bill Daley, who's only been in the White House now for, what, two or three weeks, uh, has he put his imprimatur on uh, the White Bill's House? Bill's doing a great job. Uh, you know him well as I do. Bill is a, uh, Bill is one of those uh, one of those great people you meet uh, who, in public life who takes what he does seriously without taking himself too seriously. And he's coming, it's always difficult to come in two years right. in, and he's put people at ease. There is a sense of comfort with him already, and uh, he's providing good, strong uh, uh, direction, but he's doing it in a very collegial uh, way. I think he's going to be a tremendous chief of staff. David, there's a very interesting New York Magazine piece which quotes you that says the president reevaluating after November 2 uh, wants to be uh, less insular, I think was the term they used. What are the prospects he's going to play golf with John Boehner in the next couple months? I think they're good. I think they're good. I, I, the, uh, look, I think the president wants to have a relationship uh, with uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, so that we can uh, work together where we can. He understands that there, are, there wouldn't be two parties if we didn't have differences. Right. So, you know, though that's not going to go away. Uh, but he's always believed that I even if you disagree on most things, you ought to work together on the things you can. And uh, you can't do that unless you develop a, a relationship of trust and cooperation. And he's uh, willing to do that even to the point that he'd play golf with a guy who has a much lower handicap than he does. Uh, David Axelrod, thank you for being with us. You're returning to Chicago, but you're still going to be deeply involved with the president. Will do. Uh, yeah. And safe, safe travels out Thanks, there. Thanks, And when we come back, how did the president do in the State of the Union? We talked to Bloomberg reporters now. Welcome back. President Obama gave his second State of the Union address this week. In the audience, Democrats and Republicans paired up in a rare show of civility. That ended soon enough as Obama found not one but multiple Republicans rebutting his speech. Hans Nichols Bloomberg's White House reporter and Lisa Lair, our congressional correspondent, join us to talk about future battles shaping up. Hans, the, the State of the Union address is always a political as well as a legislative uh, document. How's the White House going to follow up on this? And this year, it's a scheduling document. They hit the road, which is what they did last year. But there's going to be a real effort to kind of concentrate the themes that they had there. So innovation, education, spending about one week on each. Embedded in that strategy is a recognition that last year they didn't do such a good job getting a big bounce of it. So they're really going to try to stay on message. Lisa, there was no shortage of Republican responses to Barack Obama this week. But in general, how do the Republicans think uh, this is unfolding? Well, overall, the Republicans felt that there, he didn't focus enough on cutting spending and focus. They really hit him hard for his focus on making investments in energy, right. infrastructure, which they said was code for just more government programs. 
there was a difference in how the Republicans responded. Paul Ryan, of course, the House Budget Chief, we gave the official the response, which was pretty measured and really tried, focused on uh, the new civility that we've all been hearing so much about, while other members of the party, including Michelle Bachman and uh, Sarah Palin, took a, a bit of a harsher tone. Uh, so that, that really shows some of the cross-currents on, uh, you know, that the Republican Party will have to how deal with. How do the Republicans think this debt ceiling is going to play out? Well, it's certainly going to be a big test of the party and whether they, they can they hang together. do they have a sense of what their strategy is going to be yet? I think it's coming out. Uh, part of what we're hearing from House Speaker Boehner is saying, right. telling his caucus, this has to be an adult moment. We all have to take an adult vote, which is code for we have to raise the debt ceiling even if you may not want to because these are things that you talked about a lot on the campaign trail. He's also trying to cut a tough deal with the White House, uh, get more spending cuts. So he has something to bring back to his members to say, well, listen, we got these compromises from the White House. Now you can take this vote. It would be interesting if Paul Ryan, for all of his soaring rhetoric, will actually show us some cuts. I mean, he's talked about great generalities, but no specifics so far. Hans, does the White House see the debt ceiling playing out to its advantage, or are they worried? It, well, in a way, because their view is that this is John Boehner's problem, and that this is something, as Lisa was saying, is a test for really how grown up and adult they're going to be, especially some of those Tea Partiers. But privately, you're starting to see Tim Geithner really reach out to House Republicans, a lot of shoe leather down on Capitol Hill, talking to lawmakers, get to know you's meet and greet. It really started when he was with pres the president in India. He was already calling back to Dave Camp, the income experience. Uh, Ways and Means Chairman. It's really a play borrowed from Ben Bernanke. He made the same pivot in 2006 when Democrats took power. It's a lot easier to have good conversations when you have good relationships. Lisa, where are the congressional Democrats on these spending fights? Well, they actually see this as a winning issue for them in a lot of ways. They think that Republicans are going to have to take the spending cuts deeper than voters are willing to go. They think Obama co-opted the message a little bit by promising a five-year freeze on domestic spending, and that pushes Republicans to to make pretty intense cuts um, that they say will cut services that people like, you know, funding for cancer research, FBI agents, uh, Pell grants for students, and they think that's that voters aren't going to want to see those th kinds of things that people like cut. Most of the focus, Lisa, has been on the House so far in these uh, past couple of weeks, but the House of Lords, the Senate, <laughs> made some rules changes this week. Uh, do they amount to anything? Well, they're really big changes in the history of the Senate. I think these are the biggest changes we've seen since the 1970s, but that doesn't mean that they're actually all that big. I think that's more <laughs> of a reflection of how slow the Senate is to make changes. Uh, they cut back on the number of positions, White House positions that require, administration positions rather, that require confirmation. They cut out a few hundred of those which should uh, make things a bit easier for the administration, which has seen a lot of their personnel held up in the right. Senate. They also eliminated secret holds, which was the ability for one member to secretly uh, place a hold on a nomination. Uh, they didn't really do any major reform to the filibuster, which was something that a lot of the more liberal members of the Senate really wanted to see. Okay. We've talked mainly about fiscal matters uh, today, but other than those, are there any other deals that you see possible between the White House and Democrats and congressional Republicans? Well, given the state of divided government, the big things that the president talked about, energy, immigration, you're unlikely to see a lot of progress mm -hmm. on those over the next two years. Where you could see some movement is possibly on some trade issues. <laughs> you certainly could see it on parts of the health care law, uh, a provision that requires businesses to report on their taxes, uh, expenses over $600. That's likely to go away. You also could see something on taxes, although that's going to be a big fight with the business community. Yeah, I think that's going to be hard. The taxes yeah. is always hard. Hans, uh, Bill Daly, the imprimatur, he's clearly, he's clearly on the White House now. A whole bunch of staff changes. Uh, what's the upshot? There's more focus in the West Wing. I think that's what, uh, what you consistently hear from administration officials, less histrionics. I don't know if that's an indictment of the previous chief of staff, but that's the vibe. The atmospherics have certainly changed. The question is, is it all daily or is it also David Plouffe? So Plouffe is certainly a taskmaster, knows how to make the trains run on time. So if you see more focus, you can either attribute to Plouffe or Daly, but you just, certainly there is the sense that that's the case there. Yeah, and a new press secretary, uh, which will be the face of the White House. Yeah, Jake. Jay Carney. But tough falling in the shoes of Robert Gibbs? 
tough in terms of the podium. Gibbs, as they said, commanded the podium. What you will see with, uh, with Carney most likely is less of an effort to shape the story from the podium and more behind the scenes. Of course, he's a longtime Time Magazine correspondent, understands what motivates reporters. He'll really work on trying to shape the story behind the scenes before it escalates to the daily briefing. If he can explain to me what motivates reporters, and I can understand <laughs> Lair and Nichols, I want to go talk to Jay Carney. Finally, Egypt. Is Obama going to be with the people or with the leaders? Right now, he's with both. Right now, he's with democracy. That's the line from the White House privately. This is a very strong message that they're sending to the Egyptians. If the violence escalates on the street, the rhetoric from the White House will also intensify. It was a comment that the president made to Mubarak in a private phone conversation a couple of weeks ago before the protests really spread from Tunisia to Egypt. But remember, this pan-democracy, pan-Arab movement that we're seeing right now, Egypt is really center stage. In the past, U.S. administrations have had a strong democracy democracy line. It's always died in Egypt with Mubarak, an 82-year-old strongman yeah. knows how to squelch dissent. Delicate situation. Hans Nichols, Lisa Lear, thank you so much. And when we return, Rahm Emanuel's roller coaster race for Chicago mayor. The last word right after this break. Welcome back. We'll go to Margaret Carlson and Cato Byrne in just a moment. But first, Rahm Emanuel is back on the ballot in Chicago, a unanimous decision of the state Supreme Court. John McCormick, Bloomberg government reporter in Chicago, has been following the twists and turns in the Rahm saga. He joins us now from the Windy City. John Rahm is on the ballot. What's the upshot of all this? Can he still get 50 percent in that first race and avoid a runoff? Yeah, he's certainly within striking distance. Uh, this, uh, this episode really, uh, I never thought I'd say this about Rahm Emanuel, a, a man who's known for sending uh, dead fish wrapped in newspapers to, uh, to people, but it, this experience really has made him a sympathetic figure here in Chicago. And uh, so this months long ordeal that he's sort of gone through, I think now that it's cleared up, I think actually is gonna give him a bump. And uh, you know, the last poll had him at 44%, so he's very close to that 50% that he needs to avoid a April 5th runoff. John, as you suggest, he's a total stranger to self-doubt. Has this humbled him at all? I don't think it's humbled him, although uh, throughout this campaign, he has tried to sort of tone down his image, um, appear, uh, you know, he's really stressed his Chicago roots and, and uh, you know, he's made, you know, a point that he does have ties to Washington, but he's really tried to play up his Chicago roots and that he's a, you know, down to earth guy who knows how to go to, you know, uh, L train stops and shake hands and be out amongst the people. So I don't think it's humbled him, but it, it certainly, uh, he's tried to project a more mellow, uh, toned down image throughout the campaign. Oh boy, I'd love to see a mellow Rahm Emanuel. Uh, John, let me ask you this, who's his most formidable challenger? It's probably uh, Gary Chico. He's uh, one of two Hispanic candidates in this race. And uh, Chico maybe got a little bit of a, a second look during this period where there was a question whether Rahm would really be on the ballot. Um, he uh, uh, has a long way to go, though. I mean, he's, he's, he's in uh, you know, just barely double digits in the polls. So for him to catch Rahm at this point, he's really going to have to you know, find some spark and some new energy. Rahm, of course, is closely associated with President Obama, who called him right after the court put him back on the ballot. Is, is, th is this an unqualified plus in the president's hometown? Yeah, it, it really is an asset. I mean, uh, the president is still very popular here in his adopted hometown. And uh, Rahm, uh, you know, does make a point that he's in you know, regular contact with the president. As you said, one of the first phone calls he received uh, after this verdict came in was, was from the president. He made sure he told voters that. And uh, in, a, in a city where about a third of the voters are African-American, it is an asset to be the first chief of staff to the first African-American president. So um, that really has been a help to him. Well, John McCormick, thank you so much. It's never dull in Chicago, and we'll be back early and often, as they say. Kate and Margaret, let me turn to you. Kate, who got the upper hand in the State of the Union uh, uh, this week, Obama or the responders? Al, I think Paul Ryan, as the official They're response, uh, certainly on substance, got the upper hand. He leveled with the American space. public. The enormous fiscal crisis we face, the kind of things we're going to have to do to address it. Um, it was a reality check on President Obama's State of the Union. In November, he acknowledged the shellacking. It was fueled by voters' enormous concern over debt and deficit. And in response, he's proposing big expense of liberal boondoggles and, uh, and empty promises about regulation and modest, uh, not modest, 
freezing spending at historically high levels. Uh, his message to congressional Republicans who are determined to actually confront the fiscal crisis and our debt crisis, you're on your own. Kate? Mm -hmm. Did you, or Margaret? <laughs> Margaret wow. just, well, Republicans I are Paul not Ryan was kind of doom and gloom, and he's not confronting. I mean, there's no proposals coming out. It's just deficits are terrible. We're going to cut spending. Oh yeah, what are you going to cut? Oh, we don't know. Uh, this was an uplifting. It's a lot easier to cut spending, of, Margaret, than it is to cut programs. <laughs> yes. Let us not have anything specific except things we don't like, that like the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, Paul Ryan, doom and gloom, and by the way, no specifics. Michelle Bachman, a laughable character. She challenges Sarah Palin as you know one of the bad faces of the Republican Party. The speech was uplifting. It ended strong. It had shape, and you know the the idea. We the country has to come back from this low point that it is in. Okay, and I think I think. Obama set the stage right. for that. But what it sets the stage for also is the big fight over raising the debt ceiling, which is coming up soon. Margaret, how's it going to play out? Who's going to win that fight? Well, this is a, a great fight to have because it is going to show the split in the Republican Party between the establishment and the newcomers. The newcomers, ah, oh, anything goes, and they have no knowledge. They don't care if the United States doesn't meet its uh, debt obligations and ends up paying sky-high interest rates as a result. Okay, can they back down Obama, though, on this one? Raising, um, it will be, of course, a big face-off. Raising right. the debt limit in the face of the enormous unprecedented debt we already have is unpopular with the public. Right. So it is an opportunity for the congressional Republicans to talk about the fiscal crisis we face. And if they fashion spending cuts that seem reasonable and prudent, I think they can get them in, uh, in exchange for raising the ceiling. Yeah, no, no, it will be raised. What else they could do? They could just say, hey, here's $20 billion less than you want. You make the cuts, which could make it very, very uncomfortable for Obama. But it's going to be a fascinating yeah, saga. Yeah. And it's always fascinating to have both of you on. Thank you. Thanks, Al. And thank all of you for joining us. And we'll see you again next week. Political Capital is a production of Bloomberg Television.